The Heritage Sports Department is very happy to welcome some of our friends and co-workers to the National Sports Collectors Convention to share some of their knowledge from their broad history and collectibles. And we have Heritage Timepieces expert, Michael Schmidt. Thank you, Mike. Let me just get this, uh, if we had the disclaimer on the screen. There we go. So, uh, thanks for showing up. Mm -hmm. We, we may be dead streaming right now. It <laughs> feels a little more dead than alive. Uh, we can just let that disclaimer set the process a little bit there. How did you guys find out about this? It's on the sign up by the office. Oh, great, yeah. Cool. It would have been really lonely if you guys had not showed up. You guys collect watches? We collect sports cards, but we love for swatches. We have a few, but nothing. I used to have a Cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. I had AP. Housing crash. A lot of people did. Oh, are we good now? Yeah. Cool. So um, I'm Mike Schmidt, and I hope I didn't disappoint you by <laughs> being who I am. But uh, you know, after the presentation, if anyone brought some uh, cards or baseballs or bats, I'm happy to uh, sign those for you. And you can truthfully say that Mike Schmidt was at the Chicago Sports Convention signing things. Uh, so let's get through this disclaimer. So me, Mike Schmidt, I am the timepiece uh, consignment uh, director at Heritage Auction House based here in Chicago. Uh, but perhaps some of you may know me better from my 1990 appearance in GQ magazine. That's me with the floppy shirt and the ponytail, if you can believe that. And there I am assisting a rather buff looking Nicolas Cage, who is a, a avid, uh, uh, avid watch collector. Um, or you may uh, know me from, uh, more recently, my New York Post appearance, where I play the watch expert, uh, answering such uh, penetrating horological questions as, what was your first wristwatch? And uh, who is your favorite celebrity watch icon? Uh, spoiler alert, that would be Uma Thurman, who's actually very knowledgeable about watches and who is uh, also an avid, wa uh, avid watch collector. Um, I spent about half my career in Los Angeles where I worked for, and then managed a store called Wanna Buy a Watch on Melrose Avenue. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the watch site Hodinkee, but they anointed uh, Wanna Buy a Watch the horological epicenter of Los Angeles. And uh, just for your information, horology would be the uh, study of time. So if you hear me say, talk about horology or horologist, you'll know what I'm talking about. Then in the early 2000s to mid 2000s, uh, I worked for an authorized uh, Rolex and uh, paddock dealer. Uh, you, if you're on Instagram, please feel free to follow us at HA Timepieces, or as I like to call it, Ha Timepieces. And you can follow me at the uh, Jaded Horologist, uh, not to be confused with the Jaded Urologist, which um, is a whole different kettle of fish, so to speak. All right, now that I've established my uh, horological credentials, let's get on with this. So let me explain the uh, format, what's gonna go on here. Uh, this is going to be a five round bout. Each round is going to have a topic. Then at the end of each round, I'm going to ask for a show of hands as to who you believe should be the winner of that round. Now, uh, as a referee, I have a right to overturn uh, any and all of your votes uh, for any reason. Uh, so remember, this is a non-sanctioned event, so uh, we appreciate it if there's no wagering uh, during this. Okay, you guys ready to rumble? Yeah. Let's get to it. Let's 
All right, round one, founders. Okay, so companies love building their mythologies around their founders. You only need to think of uh, like um, Steve Jobs, um, Thomas Edison, uh, Steve Ivey. Um, and Rolex and Paddock are not exceptions. I mean, if you go to their website, you go to any book on the subject, you're bound to see a picture of one of these guys or all these guys and stories and anecdotes and myths about them. So we're going to start with in this corner, Hans Wilsdorf, weighing in, we're gonna call him at 185, he was a bit of a rotund guy. Uh, so Hans is born in Germany in 1881. As a young man, he moves to Switzerland. He clerks at a firm that exports pocket watches, and by 1905, at the age of 24, he has already established and is a partner in a watch company based in London called Wilsdorf & Davis, which would, of course, become Rolex. So from the get-go, Han sees the 20th century as the century of the wristwatch and not the pocket watch. And he's determined to make that happen sooner than later. So who is this overshadowed uh, partner by the name of Alfred Davis? Well, Alfred Davis was basically his money man. He was the checkbook of the operation. And coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, in the same year, 1905, as uh, Rolex was founded, uh, Alfred Davis marries Hans Wilsdorf's sister, which have led some to speculate, some being primarily myself, did Hans Wilsdorf leverage the charms of his sister in order to secure financing for Rolex? Don't know, but that's part of my mythology of Rolex. Anyway, by the end of World War I, Hans has uh, bought out his partner. He's moved the whole operation to Switzerland and uh, he successfully expands the brand internationally, navigates it through the Great Depression, World War II, and really focuses on the company's vertical integration and independence. So Hans passes in 1960, but in many regards, he continues to manage the company from beyond the grave, thanks to the Hans Wildorf Trust, which he set up in 1945. Hans Wilsdorf, entrepreneur, 20th century visionary, matchmaker. All right, Paddock Philippe. And in this corner, weighing in, and I'm gonna call it 165, Antony Patek, born in 1812 in Poland. If this guy looks like a swashbuckler, it's because he was. He was a Indo uh, Polish independence fighter. He was wounded twice in battle. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. He later was exiled to France, and he settles in Switzerland in around 1830. So he more or less fell into the watch business as a means of paying the rent. He's first kind of buying movements and then buying cases and having them put together and selling them to other Polish expats in Switzerland. But things, uh, th things he finds this uh, Polish watchmaker by the name of Czepik. He partners with him. Uh, things go south pretty quickly. They cut ties. But he does find another watchmaker by the name of jean Adrian Philippe. So if nothing else, uh, Paddock, he certainly knew a talented watchmaker when he saw one. Now, by all accounts, Paddock was a bit of an egomaniac, and for years he leaves Philippe's name off of, the, off of the watch altogether. The upside of his egocentricity was that he loved to promote. So he would constantly travel, attend exhibitions, he'd push their product. Ultimately, this was crucial in not only keeping the company afloat during some really rough years in Europe, but also allowed Paddock to cash in during the Gilded Age in America as he had set up some time before a partnership agreement with a company here by the name of Tiffany & Company. In 1877, with the company on solid footing and the future rosy, Paddock passes away, leaving the company in the hands of watchmaker Philippe to navigate. Anthony Patek, swashbuckler, promoter, egomaniac. And in the same corner, Weighing in at, we're going to call him like 145, it looks like, 146. jean Adrien Philippe, born in France, 1815, watchmaker extraordinaire. He invents and patents a reliable and refined keyless crown setting mechanism by the age of 27. In other words, he's figured out a way to actually set a watch without having to use a key, what we take for granted today by using a crown. He publishes hor uh, horological works and files multitudes of uh, patents throughout his career. Uh, and uh, 
through the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, he and his team continue to push the horological boundaries, producing more and more complicated timepieces. He passes in 1894 after a nearly 50-year 50, uh, 50 run with the company. jean Jean Philippe, watchmaker extraordinaire, engineer, all around nice guy. Round one is over. Ladies and gentlemen, in your opinion, a show of hands for Hans Wilsdorf as the winner of that round. Three. And Patek Philippe as the winner of round. It's four. Oh, Patek takes it by one. And I think I'm going to let that stand. I'm just in that kind of mood right now, though that may change as this presentation goes on. So uh, if anyone's keeping, Paige, would you mind keeping score? because I will forget. Okay, round two, round two, lineage. All right, I feel there's absolutely some value in evaluating the lineage of a company, that is to say the person or persons running the operation, as it tends to reflect how consistent and true to form that company is. So let's start tracing these two companies' lineage from the beginnings to the present day. We're gonna start with Rolex. Rolex 1905, of course we've got the uh, Hans Wilsdorf, Alfred Davis. By 1908, they've registered the name Rolex, and by 1915, uh, all the watches now have the Rolex name, no longer uh, Wilsdorf and Davis. By 1919, Hans buys out uh, his brother-in-law, and he moves the whole operation to Switzerland. So after 14 years, it's now officially the Hans Wilsdorf show. 1944, Hans Wildorf, he sets up a trust. And in 1960, after an amazing 55-year run, Hans Wildorf passes away. Now, in 1964, it took four years of uh, infighting before Andre Heininger uh, comes to the helm. Uh, he was the former director of watches at Rolex, and by all accounts, this was the guy that Hans wanted to see run the company. And he has a great run. This guy goes to 1992 when Patrick Heininger, uh, his son, how about that, a lawyer by training and who had joined Rolex in 86, takes over the helm for Rolex. Uh, 2008, I think we remember 2008, uh, there's a bit of a financial issue going on in the world. And uh, there's a rumored scandal that, uh, that Rolex lost $1 billion to a man by the name of Bernie Madoff. So uh, suddenly we have uh, Patrick stepping down and a guy by the name of, actually, Br let's see, Bruno Meyer. Where'd Bruno go? Oh yeah, there he goes. Bruno Meyer, former CFO, becomes CEO. A mere three years later, jean Ricardo Marni takes over the helm as CEO. He used to ma manage the Italian branch. And a mere four later after that, this guy, jean Frederic Dufour, uh, takes over. He's the new CEO. This is the first person that has, not, that has come from outside the company to run this company. His reputation is the person you call in the watch industry when your company is looking to do a makeover. Rolex timeline, let's move on to the lineage line of Paddock Fleet. 1845, you've Paddock uh, with finds Philippe. He's actually not a partner yet, but six years later, he finally convinces Paddock to make him a partner in 1851. 1877, Paddock dies after a good 32 year run and Philippe's son-in-law is elevated to director role. In 1891, Philippe retires from running the operation. He brings on board his son, Joseph Philippe, and a guy named uh, Anthony Conti, who is the first non-family member to uh, lead the company. Three years later, jean uh, jean Philippe passes away after a nearly 50-year run with the company. And by 1901, the company restructures to become basically what we call an LLC with a board of directors with the grandson, Adrian Philippe, running, running that operation. 1932, so 1932 is a pivotal year for Patek Philippe. They're on the verge of bankruptcy, and the company is sold to the Stern family. Uh, it's gonna be run by Charles and Gene Stern. That's uh, Gene Stern's on, uh, who may be an FBI photo for World War II. Um, so those guys are now running Patek 
until 58, and then the son, Henry Stern, takes over from, uh, from his dad, Charles, becomes president of uh, Patek Philippe. 93, we continue to see a nice run of Stearns here. We've got Philippe Stern, uh, son of Henry Stern, and here we are today, Theory Stern, Theory Stern son of Philippe, uh, assume the helm. Completing our two lineage lines, Ladies and gentlemen, Rolex v. Paddock, lineage lines. I, I, I put it to you. Consistency of lineage. Who do we like? Rolex, hands for Rolex. One, two, three, four. Four hands for Rolex. Paddock Philippe, lineage line. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. five. Oh, I'm going to give it to Paddock. I think that was a fair count, don't you? Yeah, I think so. All right, let's move along. Going round three, innovations. Uh, innovations, this would sort of be bragging rights of the company. Uh, in this round, I've cherry-picked for the purpose of this presentation what I believe to be some of the key points worth mentioning. I'm not, you know, every patent, every small advancement is not going to be uh, on this timeline. We would be here all day and we would be in the room. So, let's start. Uh, Rolex timeline, 1910. Okay, this first wristwatch to receive a Swiss certificate of chronometric precision. So um, what does that mean? So what that means in the world of horology, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, this means basically the watch has been submitted to a third party. It's been timed in several positions under various temperatures and has performed exceptionally well. For Rolex to have beat all the other watch companies in earning this distinction for a wristwatch really proves where Hans intends on taking the company. And it's a mere four years later that it's the first wristwatch, not pocket watch or clock, to receive a Class A precision certificate from the Kew Observatory in London. So that's a mouthful. So Hans has to up himself four years later. He gets this Class A certificate. So this was a certificate that up to this point was only reserved for marine chronometers. So marine chronometers are clocks and need to be incredibly precise because what they do is they're aiding the ship in navigation. And at this point, Hans has really proved to the, to the public that a wristwatch can keep accurate time. 1926, introduction of the oyster. I think if you've actually owned a Rolex, so oftentimes you'll see that word on the dial. What this refers to is the fact that it's a water-resistant, waterproof watch, if you will. It's not actually the first waterproof watch, but it's the first waterproof wristwatch that actually looks like a wristwatch and not some large pocket watch double encased strapped to the wrist. I mean, this watch is about 26 millimeters, maybe five millimeters thick. So it was a pretty, really impressive feat in 1926 to produce this watch. 1931, so we have the introduction of the perpetual. And again, you may have seen that word on uh, many of their watches. So this, this is a watch that is powered by a rotor, so there's no winding needed any longer. Again, this is not the first automatic watch, but it is the first reliable automatic watch. And this really completes Hans trilogy. So he now has chrono, chronometer certification, waterproof, and an odd, odd winding mechanism. Uh, these all of Hans' primary goals, and he achieved them in a remarkably short time. So this is the stuff that really is what a Rolex is made of. This is why Rolex is popular. I mean, this this is their bragging rights. Um, and all really all the other models from this point on are simply kind of derivatives of this 1931 model. But just to take it a little further, uh, 1945, they introduced the Datejust, very popular watch. It was the first automatic watch with a calendar. Um, and in 1954, we get the introduction of the Submariner. Uh, now we have a watch that's actually rated to 100 meters. That was the Rolex Innovation Timeline. We're going to move on to Patek Philippe. 
Now, if this had the subtitle, it'd be It's Complicated because Patek Philippe, they love complications. Now, this might get a little lengthy, so I just want you to buckle in, have a drink, take a deep breath. 1845, uh, we're going to start again with the patent for a keyless winding and hand setting system. As previously mentioned, this is a big deal as it eliminates the need for a watch key. 1868, first Swiss manufactured wristwatch. Also worth noting that the movement is rectangular and not round. So up to this point, movements were round. They were for pocket watches. They were for little pendant watches. Sometimes a woman would wear a pendant watch on her wrist with a ribbon. This is really the Swiss watch to be manufactured for the purpose as a wristwatch. There it is. 1923, uh, there's something called this a split seconds wristwatch where they made the first split seconds wristwatch. So what that means is this is basically a chronograph, okay? It's a watch that has a stopwatch function, but a split seconds will allow for the timing of two intervals that start at the same instant. This is not, in today's age, it doesn't sound like this should be a big deal, but to create a mechanical device to achieve this is really, truly incredible. 1925, first wristwatch with a perpetual calendar. So not to confuse you, but yesterday, you in this perpetual calendar where perpetual refers to not the fact that it's automatic as a Rolex but the fact that this watch is going to keep an accurate measure of the month the day of the month the day of the week and it takes into account leap years until the year February of 2100 so in other words, if you kept this watch powered every day, you would not need to reset the watch until February of 2100. 1927, very famous watch called the Packard is delivered. Um, the Packard was indeed commissioned by the automobile manufacturer of the same name. It's a double-sided astronomical pocket watch featuring a rotating celestial map of 500 gold stars accurately depicting the night sky over Warren, Ohio, Ohio, which is where the Packards lived. It was an unbelievable hor horological feat. It took five years to make, and it also played their mother's favorite song. 1933, The Graves is delivered. This is a watch that was actually commissioned before the Stern brothers even took over the company. So Henry Graves was a super wealthy guy from a banking family. He loved complicated watches. This one had two dozen complications, over 900 parts. It weighed a little over one pound. It took over five years to produce. All right, before I get into these uh, next models, we're, we're heading into World War II. Uh, you have to take into account that the war Precious metal are scarce. There's no luxury market at all. And while other watch companies are producing base metal and stainless steel watches for military use with maybe a chronograph function, the watchmakers at Paddock decided to produce in 1941 a perpetual calendar wristwatch, but in series. So they're not just gonna make one perpetual calendar wristwatch, they're gonna just start making them same year, 1941, they're going to make a first perpetual calendar chronograph wristwatch. So they thought they'd also add on the chronograph, the stopwatch function, to the perpetual calendar wristwatch. Three years later, 1944, they produced the first sweep seconds perpetual calendar wristwatch. So it appears that the, uh, the boys at Paddock, they had a little time on their hands to catch up on some major projects while there was a war waging around them. Uh, 1945, they revolutionized the, uh, the uh, balance by introducing Gyromax balance. I know there's a lot of Gyromax balance hands up. You were waiting for 1949. Yeah. 1951 produces a perpetual calendar wristwatch with sweep seconds, not sub, not the little sub seconds, but the big sweep seconds in series. So it's now a watch they're just going to produce. And in 1962, they're the first to create a self-winding perpetual calendar watch. In other words, you didn't have to wind it 
It now had a rotor. So I guess if Rolex had created this watch, it would have been called a perpetual, perpetual calendar. It's like some horological humor there. Uh, 1989, they're celebrating their 150th anniversary with the caliber 89. Check out this watch. It has 33 complications. It was the most complicated watch in the world at the time. It has 1,728 components. It weighs over two pounds. It took the one spot from the Graves, which was produced way back in 1933. Four were produced, one in 18 yellow gold, one in white gold, one in rose gold, and one in platinum. And just to fill out this timeline, 2014, it's the Grandmaster Chime, and I'm always tempted to say it's the Grandmaster Flash Chime. It's the most complicated paddock wristwatch ever made. It boasts 20 complications. It has a reversible case, two independent dials, six patented innovations. The development, production, and assembly process covered a staggering 100,000 hours, which beat uh, what the time it took for me to produce this presentation by about uh, 100 hours. All right. That was round three, ladies and gentlemen. So we know what we do now. It's time for voting. Uh, let's start with Rolex again. Innovations, Rolex innovations. I have wah, wah, two hands. Oh my God, I think I know where this is going. Paddock Philippe, innovations. Whoa, just blew them out of the water. I'm like, I can't even count that high. Paige, duly noted. Three to zero. The referee may have to step in at some point. I don't know. How are we doing time by? You guys still good? No appointments? OK. All right, so we're let's hit round four. Round four, marketing. Hmm. OK, let's start with names. So you know, there have been a few uh, stories circulating through the years about the origin of the name Rolex. Uh, the first story I heard when I, got, I started in this business way back when was that it, they called it Rolex because it was universally easy to pronounce. Well, as someone who has sold Rolex to people from every continent on the earth, I can assure you it's not a name is actually universally easy to pronounce. Uh, the next story is that uh, Rolex sort of referred to rolling, like rolling a crown, back and forth. Uh, but my favorite story, and this is actually on their website, is the story of Hans Wilsdorf on a double-decker bus in London on some foggy morning, you know, half asleep, and he's kind of nodding off, and then he hears this genie, and it's described as a genie, whisper in his ear, Rolex, and that is where the name came from, a genie, a genie. It's on the website. I mean, I can't make this up. Um, so this is a really romantic, I think, notion of the name Rolex, but I have a, uh, I sort of have an alternate theory on where the name of Rolex came up. So three years prior, before the genie whispered in his ear in 1908, there was a watchmaker, watchmaker by the name of Dietersheim, and Dietersheim also saw the 20th century as a century of the wristwatch, and he rebrands himself. He's the first person to rebrand himself for the 20th century for wristwatches instead of just having the, the name of, you know, the person who makes the watch and manufacturer on the dial. And he calls himself, anybody know? Movado. Movado, as in moving, as in always in motion. So I, it's, it's my theory that if Hans was on a double-decker bus that morning and going through London fog, that he may have seen a jewelry store with the, with the name of Vado go, going up on it and going, oh my God, this guy's beaten me to the punch and realized he really needed to get uh, his rebranding going. Though they, I'm sure they didn't call it rebranding back in the turn of the last century. Uh, Patek Philippe, Patek Philippe. I mean, that's just old school through and through. What can you say? You know, pretty classic. Let's go to logos, all right? Uh, so the coronet, uh, this is obviously a symbol of royalty, you know, the head of, 
uh, crowning achievement, the five points of the crown symbolizing five fingers of the hand. This has really great marketing appeal, but maybe by today's standards, maybe a little too obvious. You know, I'm thinking maybe maybe even a little cheesy. You know, I'm thinking Burger King, um, Imperial Margarine commercials. Anyone remember Imperial Margarine commercials? Yeah. So um, I don't know. Maybe I don't think that they'll be changing that logo soon. But you know, it's it's. I think it's maybe hitting its time. Uh, let's move on to. Actually, I'm going to back you up one. The uh, Calatrava, the Calatrava, that's for Paddock, of course. This is a really strong, really vibrant uh, symbol, logo. Uh, it was originally the symbol for an order of Catholic knights who expelled Muslims from an area of Spain. So maybe the boys at Paddock hadn't really thought that through as to how that might affect their sales in certain parts of the world, but I don't think they're going to be losing that uh, logo anytime soon. But beautiful, dynamic logo, absolutely. Um, marketing is interesting because, to me, there's also times in companies where a product needs to be developed or put, put out that's not really within their line to reach a larger market. So what's really interesting is that, you know, prior to what we call the president, the day date, um, Rolex was basically just kind of a, a reliable workhorse watch. It wasn't considered a luxury watch. Well, what happened after World War II, people, you know, they wanted to start showing off some of their money and they wanted to have nice things. So through the 50s, a lot of watch companies were producing gold watches. They weren't necessarily automatic, but they looked nice and people were buying them. And the guys at Rolex are like, well, what are we going to do? We got to, you know, well, what they did is they came up with the day date. They came up with what we call the president. And this was just, uh, this just took off. I mean, this was brilliant. This really launched them into the luxury market, this, this model alone. Um, the interesting thing is the Rolex never called this watch the president. They'll call the bracelet the presidential bracelet, but they always refer to it as the day date, though the general public still refers to it as the president. And yes, presidents have worn this watch. Um, just one anecdote about, about the day date. When I, when I started doing this in the late 80s, I was working at a vintage watch store. And there was a gentleman in from Texas, and he was kind of perusing our vintage watches and vintage Rolex. And he uh, kind of comes up to the counter. And he does the, uh, you know, the watch reveal, the like, you know, like, ah, oh, yeah. So he does the watch reveal to me, and he goes, you know what that is? So I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, it's a day, day, but I'm not going to say it's a day. I'm going to tell him it's a president. It's, you know, yeah, I go, that's a president. He goes, nope, that's a Texas Timex. I mean, that really, sort, that really tells you the success of this model, you know, that, that it was just so ubiquitous as a symbol of, of, of luxury and of achievement. And let's go to our friends at Paddock Philippe. So there's a couple models that really broadened the Paddock line and really got them into a whole different area. The first is this really unassuming watch here, which is called the Calatrava. So when the Stern brothers took over in the 30s, one of the reasons Paddock was going bankrupt is they were making super complicated pocket watches. Well, not everyone could afford a super complicated pocket watch. Not everyone wanted the super. People wanted wrist watches. And they wanted simple wrist watches. So they finally came up with just a simple wrist watch for people. It was called the Calatrava. And it's become a standard model in their line still today. They make canvas and kind of really there during the press. Uh, and then what I think you're probably familiar with is called the Nautilus. This has become extremely popular over the last certainly five years, especially. So the, the guys at Paddock, and I say guys because at that time they were they were guys sitting around a room. They were figuring out, hey, um, maybe we should make like a sports watch 
you know, every, everyone else is making sport watches. Should we venture into that area? Well, they did, and they came up with the Nautilus. Uh, it's a beautiful watch designed by uh, Gerald Genta. Um, and it was okay, it was received well. Um, but as time went on, it really grew a cult following to the point where, probably much to Paddock's chagrin, it almost became their poster child. It's like, it's not what they were really about. They were just trying to get a little action in the sport market. Uh, and it's become probably their most recognizable watch to the general public today. Now, what they did or felt compelled to do is take this beautiful sort of elegant sports watch and then start adding, because they're paddock, they have to add complications, right? They couldn't leave well enough alone. So they started adding and they started power reserves and they started adding chronographs to the point where, in my opinion, it's just kind of gotten ridiculous. It's almost like if Rolex took their Submariner and said, let's make the Submariner a chronograph and, you know, let's have a power reserve and let's make it something it was never, really, it never intended for. But the fact still remains, it's been hugely successful. So these are two, two models that really expanded their marketing. It was very successful. All right, let's get into some numbers, all right? Because we're talking basic advertising numbers. Now, from day one, you know, when, when Hans, Hans and David started this thing, they, they really understood uh, advertising and marketing, and that was a huge emphasis from day one. And they've just destroyed the competition till today in the amount of money they spend to advertise. Uh, just for an example, I mean, here you get, you know, very consistent in that $60 million range spending in advertising compared to Paddock 2013, they're at $6 million, and you do see they're making an effort at $20 million, but nowhere near what, what, what uh, Rolex does for marketing and advertising. Uh, Hans was also one of the earliest to, he understood the, uh, the um, power of the testimonials from athletes and explorers. And today Rolex has like 36, 37, 38 uh, brand ambassadors who are athletes. Um, I know when I travel, you can't help but see like a Rolex clock somewhere or, you know, certainly my phone knows what I'm looking at, so I'm always seeing Rolex ads. I mean, it's just ubiquitous. Their name is everywhere. Um, Paddock, let's see, oh, here we go. Here's a little montage just to give you a sense of what's been going on through the decades. Some really cool ads in there. And that never stopped, keeps going. And Paddock, blah, 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 blah. Mm, Paddock, mm, Paddock, not so much. But, <laughs> but I have to, I mean, really, when they did this, they really did it right. I mean, they stepped up. I mean, this campaign's amazing. Um, <clears throat> you never actually own a Paddock. You merely look after it for the next generation. I mean, this is really powerful advertising. This really, to me, captures the spirit of Paddock perfectly. And it's such a great contrast to Rolex, you know. Rolex feels like if they haven't sold your kid to Rolexes before you die, they have not done their job. You know, forget like handing it down. You know, they're, they're out to get the kids way before that happens. Um, is that the end? That's the end of round four? The end of round four. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the marketing round. Now, I'm gonna start with Rolex again. Rolex? Oh, here we go, yeah, there we go. We gotta throw one over to them, okay. Do I even need the Patek Philippe? Wah, wah, two. All right, yay, Rolex is finally on the board. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, we can, maybe you do this. Should we do the fifth round real quick? You guys okay? Sure. All right. Well, let's go to round five. This is a quick round. Round five. Exclusivity. Hmm. Hmm. I think I already know. All right. 
Let's throw out some numbers. Authorized dealers worldwide. Uh, and this is from about six months ago. These numbers may have changed, but they probably changed in proportion. 1,816 worldwide dealers, 353 paddock. That's interesting. Production uh, per year. You know, Rolex likes to give the impression of exclusivity, but let's face it, they're, they're cranking out, um, you know, easily a million units a year, no problem. Um, Patek Philippe, well, they figured, we're figuring like 50,000 watches a year at this point. Entry level cost, Rolex, uh, if that model is available, $6,400. Uh, Paddock, if that model is available, 21650 And there's some examples of your uh, Oyster Perpetual 41, 6400, Lady Deja 69, Air King 7450. Again, as you know, some of these watches become extremely difficult to get, but that is the, the, retail, the retail price from Rolex. Uh, go look at Paddock Philippe. You've got introductory prices on the Aquanaut, if you can find one, at 21650 Calatrava at 2400 So just the mere comparison, not getting into secondary markets and how, what's going on there, but you can get a really good sense of where you're at as far as pricing and who's buying these watches. There, I told you this would be a quick round because I think it's a no-brainer. Should we start with Paddock this time? I think we have to start with Paddock this time. Exclusivity. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow! It's, it's, just, it's just devastating. We don't even have to do hands for Rolex. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've forgotten now, really. Who is the winner of this match? Rolex v. Paddock. What month are we in? August, July 28th, 2023. The winner is Paddock. The referee stands by that decision. The winner is Paddock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out today. I will be signing balls, bats, and mitts after the presentation. I'm Mike Schmidt. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Yeah. My Rolex says it's the 29th. Oh, the 29th. I don't know. I don't know. Wait, I haven't slept in three days. What do I know? Oh, it's not right. A testament to the accuracy of that watch. Hey, does anyone actually have questions? I mean, I know that was kind of a presentation, but yes. Yes. They did. They made very limited numbers. I mean, there's there's very few Rolex pocket watches. They did it out of sort of feeling like a necessity, like there's still old timers around who wanted a pocket watch, or, you know, sometimes you feel a nostalgia for pocket watch. So they did produce pocket watches. Uh, they still, I think, produce in their Cellini line. Have you heard of the Cellini line? C I L L I. So they do some, uh, I think they still actually, they may still produce a pocket watch within that line. That's like their dress, dressy line. But yes, they, they did, and I think still do produce small amounts of pocket watches. Anyone else? Yes? I've seen Travel Rolex sell for large premiums. Are there other manufacturers who express watches sell for higher Yes. So distressed watches have become a thing. Certainly in the last, um, I start seeing it happening maybe 15, 20 years ago. It very, very, and it, it's now evolved into an appreciation for uh, watches that have been distressed. So in other words, when I started doing this, if a dial was brown, dials tend to change colors through the ages, um, or if they look dirty, um, or if they changed colors, sometimes a dial will change colors through the year. That was not considered a, uh, a good thing. So those dials were usually like taken off or try to find a, a dial for it. Today that's considered really a good thing. And depending on the aesthetic, of the dial, of, of how it looks. Um, there's something called tropical, which means the dial tends to turn like a brown color, which is very common with black dials through the years. Some of them turn brown. So that quality has become 
very sought after. So some, some Rolex or any, actually any brand now with a tropical dial can get s easily sometimes double the amount for the same watch without a tropical dial. So it's interesting how that's happened. I think in coins that may have happened, I'm not a coin guy per se, but I think with toning and like rainbow effect, I think that wasn't seen at one time as desirable and now it's hugely desirable. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> There's a, it's not a complicated answer. That's why I just say yes. Yes, absolutely. They you hear about wait, the wait list to get. Of course, they can. They can produce as many watches as, as they desire. They just so don't desire, you know. And it's a strategy that's worked incredibly well for them, you know. They're the most secretive watch company in the world. They're not going to tell you anything. They're not, when, they, when they have to make a statement about, oh, why, why are there no Rolexes? They go, oh, you know, it's COVID, and people are sick, and, you know, we just can't get the materials, you know, it's an issue of getting, and it's just, it's just BS. They can do whatever they want to do. They're just not doing it, you know? They're holding back on you. They, they are. Yeah, it's very frustrating, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that. I know the subject can be dry. I hope it wasn't very dry. Give some water if it was dry. And uh, we'll see you downstairs. Uh, guys, keep track of us. We have events at the Chicago. Are you from Chicago? No. Oh, oh never mind. <laughs> <laughs> We, have, we do have events at the Chicago office. Thank you. <laughs>